Uh, Father Colin Kelly, formerly the rector at uh, Trinity on the Hill in Los Alamos. You'll understand why that matters in a moment. Now the vicar of all St. Jerome's in Chama. So come on up and ride the train and drop by St. Jerome's and go to church on Sunday if you like. But that's not why we're here. We're here because of an amazing young woman. She's amazing for many reasons. One of them is that she married Robert <laughs> Gibson. <laughs> She had the courage to do that. She had the courage to do that and the, and the foresight, the insight to do that. And I share that with you because um, the way that I became involved is that I was also the uh, president of the family council. And uh, Robert had come to some of our meetings to, on various reasons. And I thought, boy, he would be great to be a member of the family council. As a matter of fact, I would love to have him succeed me as president of family council. But Robert was here. He, he was way ahead of me when we sat down in my office to chat. I said, Robert, we chatted a bit. He said, well, you know, I'd love to do family council, but I'm getting married. I said, oh, wonderful. And who are you marrying? He said, well, Laurie Heimdall. Oh, OK. Um, well, that's wonderful. Uh, who's going to marry you? Well, we, we don't know yet. I said, well, I'd be happy to do that. Where are we going to, thinking they'd be married in the church somewhere? I said, where are you going to get married? On top of Sarah Petter now. Oh, OK. <laughs> now. Both he and Laurie fly, but they did not fly us to the top of Cerro Pedernal. We climbed up. My wife, who was going to play the guitar, but a while along the way we decided the guitar was more than we needed to be carrying going up the, the mountain. But we were there to an amazing setting for that wedding, and that's what brought us together. And uh, we've kept in touch along the way, and then we lost touch for a while. Until one day, a couple of years ago, Sue Ellen and I were going into the ATU at the hospital to begin her cancer treatment, and there we found Robert and Laurie again. And so our, our paths crossed a number of times on the days that we would be there for the treatments at the same time. And when the time came for this service to be important, um, I reached out to Robert and he to me, and we decided we would uh, work together on this service today. So on the front of your bulletin, you'll see where it says Laurie Heimdall Gibson, born on June the 4th, just a couple of days before Sue Ellen was, but a couple of years after, and went to be with the Lord on March 20th, 2021. And I love this part on the front. It says, she had a gypsy soul and a warrior spirit. She made no apologies for her wild heart. She left normal and regular to explore the outskirts of magical and extraordinary. And she was, and still in our hearts, is glorious. There's no question of that. I wanted to begin with a brief prayer. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our sister Laurie. We thank you for giving her to us, her family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And with Laurie, I have no doubt that she is with us, not just in spirit, but perhaps having learned how to pilot a glider, she may be gliding above us rather than make the noise of her airplane that she would so loved. Such an amazing person, and we'll hear more about her from Robert and from others in the family. But now I think it's time for us to join in singing an ode somewhere out there. And this is when we get to sound like Linda Ronstadt. So the words to this song you'll find inside your bulletin. And as best you can, as best you desire, we'll be hearing it played, and we'll sing along with it.
And the one who joined Laurie, not only out there in time, but here and now, Robert Gibson. First, I want to thank all of you for being here today to, oops. <laughs> He already knew he should drown me out before I said anything, I guess. Uh, we're here to honor a remarkable life. But Lori wanted this to be a party, a celebration. I know there's mourning, but uh, we want to keep the emphasis on the, on the celebration part. She also wanted it to be outdoors, and that's why we're out in the slightly warm sun today. The person that Lori would become was evident, even in her crib. Before she could walk, she learned to climb out, crawl to the kitchen, pull out the drawers to make steps, and climb to the upper cabinets. She could unlock the front door, too. Her parents tied her to her mattress. Next morning, she was standing in her crib, mattress strapped to her back, trying to climb out. <laughs> of course, she did learn to walk, not only in the usual way, but also on her hands, up and down stairs, upside down. She loved to climb, trees naturally, cut her down spouts, anything she could climb, and eventually mountains. She excelled in many other athletic pursuits too, running, high jumping, water skiing, racquetball. She was not a good student. She was smart enough, but she didn't like sitting still listening to a teacher. She wanted to be outdoors, moving around. That frustration with the traditional regimented classroom motivated much of her later teaching style. She also became a motorhead. Uh, probably came from the thrill she got from locomotives when she accompanied her dad to work at the train station. Her favorite dates in high school were her boyfriend's garage setting lifters on his 57 Chevy. College was at Moorhead State in Minnesota. Her majors were English, speech, and drama. She still was not focused on academics but was good enough to get a prime teaching job right out of school. She taught those subjects to high schoolers for more than a decade, including directing both school and summer plays. Any of you that have done that know how much fun that is. She soon married and had a son, Bobby. She set his life's direction before he was born. She was still rocketing around on snowmobiles with eight months pregnant. Bobby got the bug. Snowmobiling has been his lifelong passion. He raced professionally in his 20s and still lives for that thrill when he's not managing the family restaurant in Gray Eagle, Minnesota. Unfortunately for all, the marriage did not last. Lori embarked on her most challenging of on that most challenging of life's paths, single mom. While raising Bobby was her first priority, it did not limit the dimensions of her life. When he was two, she bought her first motorcycle, a little Honda. That began a riding odyssey that spanned 45 years. She was proud that she never dropped a bike. She never scratched one or herself. She was an excellent rider. After 11 years in the classroom, she began to feel stale. So she took a year off and toured the Western United States and Alaska in a van. She did not return to teaching right away. Most of the next decade, she was in sales, at which she was good also. She parlayed one commission into flying lessons and earned her private pilot's license. She became an excellent pilot, too. When she was 39, she met a four-year-old neighbor named Alicia. Alicia had a most unfortunate family background. They shared the same birthday and initially bonded over that. Their relationship was much like the Big Brothers Big Sisters promotes, a loving adult in the life of a young person who could really benefit from one. They went places and did things together. Even as a little girl, Alicia had the internal strength to overcome her origins. Lori was there to love and guide her as Alicia grew into a strong, self-reliant, multi-talented adult. Today, she's a successful urban and economic planner for the Minneapolis suburb of Minnetonka. 
Lori was just as proud of her as she was of her own son. Eventually, after another failed marriage, Lori went back to the classroom where she excelled at dealing with difficult students. She'd find a way. One big macho bruiser that decided he was going to show this skinny school marm who was boss until he found out she rode a Harley. <laughs> Instant respect and connection. At Easter time in 1999, she and her sister Mary came to New Mexico to find Mary a place to relocate. In 24 hours, they made friends and they bought a house. She jumped off the cliff, as she called it, and moved from metropolitan Minneapolis to the far suburbs of metropolitan Abiquiu. Home was a double wide at the end of a ruddy dirt road with an arroyo through the front yard and cowboys riding past. To that city girl, it was the Wild West. They named their home El Rancho de las Hermanas Brancas, the ranch of the Wild Sisters. <laughs> she found a job that fit her perfectly at UNM Los Alamos. She was a student, excuse me, a student advisor and also developed a course called New Beginnings. It was for students, mostly women, who were starting over for various reasons. She had walked in their shoes. The job entailed a long commute, but she so enjoyed the natural beauty of the drive up the hill that she cried almost every day. It was at UNMLA that she met this local nerd. Two and a half years later, a very, very courageous Lori decided she might be able to put up with me for the long haul. The wedding was pure Lori. It was on top of Cerro Pedernal, overlooking Abiquiu. Lori the climber, led the seven-member wedding party while I carried her outfit up in a backpack. Our reception was at the social center of Abiquiu, Bodie's general store. She moved to Los Alamos with some trepidation. After all, we glow in the dark. But she discovered that even physicists and bomb designers are real people too. She grew to love this town, although she always thought it a bit quirky. Meanwhile, she moved on to what she called her best job at Enlace, as Enlace Coordinator at Northern. She developed programs to help Española high schoolers really learn how to study and take charge of their own learning experience. It was very successful. She loved her largely Hispanic students, and they loved her back. In spite of her white skin and Minnesota accent, she had no trouble connecting. 2005, she retired, sort of. She did make another memorable trip back to school. A friend who taught kindergarten in Santa Fe invited her to her class. Lori did not go as another old lady school teacher to these youngsters. No, she went as the Tooth Fairy. How did they know she was the Tooth Fairy? Because she had decals like that, plastered all over her helmet, her leathers, and her bike. Yes, the Tooth Fairy arrived at kindergarten on a Harley. They had a blast. Passionate about young people, Lori was not ready to leave teenagers yet either. She recognized from her work the huge divide between hill and valley kids. So she created a program to address it. Juntos, together in Spanish, was her full-time passion as a volunteer for more than three years. She brought together hill and valley teenagers for fun events and deep discussions. She guided them to discover that they were really not all that different. They made connections too, and many of them became close and long-term friends. Semi-retirement brought flexibility for other adventures. Over the next dozen years, she traveled to all seven continents and more than 20 countries. Her all-time favorites were Antarctica and Egypt two places neither of us had on our radar until six months before we went. One of her longtime dreams was to fly in a fighter jet. When I arranged for, with a friend for her to not only ride in one, but to actually fly it, her response was, what have you gotten me into now? <laughs> her anxiety continued through ground trading and right up, till, up until she looked down into the unfamiliar cockpit. The real Lori took over. She told herself, 
I can do this. And do it she did. After instructor demonstrated, she took over and flew rolls and loops and high G turns. She even landed the plane herself, twice. That megawatt smile got even brighter. <laughs> Two big adventures did not involve adrenaline. Early in 2013, Lori's daughter, Luna, was born. We became the maternal grandparents that Luna didn't have. Lori embraced her new role with as much love and gusto as any other grandmother. Two and a half years ago, the cancer that Lori had been battling for more than five years already took a very sudden and awful turn. She lived the rest of her life in pain, often, often severe. A bigger loss to her was that of her independence. She had to rely on others. She was forced to receive instead of always giving. But she was still resilient. Again, she reinvented herself. She had what she called a rich inner life that made it worth being here as long as she could. As long as I've known her, she maintained that she was not afraid of death. In one of our very last lucid conversations, I asked her how she felt about what she was facing. Was she afraid? No, she replied clearly, I'm curious. Love, adventure, connection, courage, resilience, energy, curiosity. That was our Lori. Her remarkable spirit lives in all she touched, and the world is a better place for it. But you already knew that. Thank you for listening anyway. And thank you for being among the many, many friends that were so much a part of Lori's life. Again, I thank you all for being here, and I'd like to invite you to listen to Lori's favorite song, I Believe by Andrea Bocelli and Katherine Jenkins. Please listen closely to the words. That's what Lori really liked about this. It was her. Thank you. So beautiful, we're going to do it again. <laughs> so moving every time I hear that. So many facets to Laurie's life and the way that she lived and the way she approached all these things. Robert gave us such a beautiful insight into her. And I want to hear from some of her family and friends. And I think Alicia is going to start us off with that. Lori was and always will be a, a special person to me and my family. 
As many of you know, Lori and I met when I was four years old. She lived in the apartment above mine in St. Cloud, where I lived with my dad. One day I was out playing and I spotted Lori out zipping around on a pair of rollerblades, which were new sports gear at the time that were invented in Minnesota. Lori was wearing a neon windbreaker where the top and the bottom matched. I remember she had short hair and I thought she was the coolest person I had ever seen. One afternoon, I decided to go up to her apartment to talk to her. She opened the door. She was a little bit surprised to see me, given that I was only four years old and I was wandering around by myself. <laughs> and she asked me when my birthday was. I ran downstairs to ask my dad and ran back up again, practicing the date as I ran so I wouldn't forget it. I reported back June 4th. She said, no way, that's my birthday. And at that moment, I knew we had a special bond and we stayed connected uh, from that day moving forward. Throughout our lives, Lori would tell various parts of our story to pretty much anyone that would listen. I remember in my teenage years being so embarrassed as she recounted the stories of me as a scruffy little kid to complete st strangers. <laughs> as I became older, I grew to appreciate the retelling of those stories and how she would gain so much joy from telling others about our story. Our friendship strengthened over the years as I looked up to Lori as the most normal person in my life. It's funny to me now because Lori was anything but normal. She was extraordinary. In 1999, Lori moved to New Mexico. This was the same year I graduated from high school. We kept in touch and I was able to make a few trips down to visit every couple of years. Some of my favorite memories with her involved the car ride from Abiquiu to New to Los Alamos. We would sing Cat Stevens and our other favorite songs. Later, I believe, we blasted that song so loud we probably lost our hearing a bit. <laughs> uh, Lori would point out the unique things along the way. Camel Rock, Rio Grande, Black Mesa. She would name all the mountains every time. During those two hours, she also had a way of getting me to talk about all the things I wasn't necessarily wanting to share. Those were our therapy sessions. On February 16th, 2013, our lives changed forever when Luna Ruby Gray was born. Luna, Lori immediately asked if her and Robert could be Nana and Grampy to Luna, which was an absolute yes. Both Lori and Robert adored Luna from the day she was born, which made our bond even stronger. She later came up with the term daughter of the heart as a phrase to describe our relationship. I always referred to Lori as my mother and I learned that your family is larger than the one you were born into. As Lori's battle with cancer became more difficult over the past few years, we became closer. Through the pandemic, we were able to connect several times a week to share Luna's latest artwork, which sometimes they did together over a video call. We gave virtual walkthroughs of the latest house projects we were working on as we had just moved into a new home. And we had several discussions on spirituality and what happens next in life. What I'll remember most about Lori is that she loved and cared about others on a deeper level that, than any other person I've ever met. She always fought for the underdog, even as a child, which was evident from her stories about her siblings, her many students, and later on, the disenfranchised groups for whom she advocated for. She pushed boundaries, becoming a pilot, riding the Harley, flying the jet, and fulfilling her desire to become a better artist. All of these things I looked up to. She taught me that it's never too late in life to do anything and to do what makes you happy, which applies to her life in so many ways. And she always said, trust your gut and Really, feel all the feelings when you are upset. Advice I think about often. Our family will miss her greatly, but she will never be forgotten. We love you, Nana.
and Pete is, Pete is going to share something with us. If Pete is here. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Pete. Yeah. Joe. 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 I'm sorry, Joe. I th oh, Joe, right. Joe is going to speak for Pete. There we go. I'm a friend of Pete who delegated me. Thank you. Yes, I'm sorry, Joe. <laughs> I can only read my own handwriting. <laughs> like I said, I'm, I'm here to read uh, my friend Pete Heimdall's tribute to his sister Lori. Uh, uh, Pete and his wife Carrie just uh, moved to Minnesota, so they couldn't make it to this uh, memorial today. So here I go, here we go. Little note, to, it's not very long, so it's okay. Lori was always the strong one. She was the one able to stay composed while she gave eulogies for our grandparents, our parents, and our siblings, David and Anne, and many others. Lori was the strong one in many ways. One of the most vivid childhood memories of Lori, she was six years older than I, was her effortlessly going up and down the stairs to the second floor while doing a handstand, just like Robert told us about. She was about 14 or 15. She obviously received all the athletic genes in the family. None of, none of the other ones have any. <laughs> she, she was the strong one who always stood up to bullies. She was a strong ally to anybody who faced injustice. And all of you here know that Lori also had a strong compassion for others. Lori was strong, strong and determined in facing her seven-year ordeal with breast cancer. But being so strong in life made seeing her ravaged body during her end days so very difficult. Life will be tough without having Lori's strength and love to turn to. I want to thank Robert Gibson for everything he did to help Lori during his last years. He was fortunate to have him as an advocate. I can speak for everyone in the family, and there's a lot of them in the Midwest, that will greatly admire Robert and will always consider him to be part of our family. I'm done. Thank you, Joe. Sandy? Thank you, Sandy's going to share some personal remembrances. Can you hear me? No. A little bit louder. Can you can you hear me? No. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, I met Lori about a little over 15 years ago um, through a group of extraordinary women, and we called ourselves the Gathering Gals. And um, I think it was Lori who renamed us to the GGs. Um, and um, we did, we would come together as a group of women, almost like a, almost like a tribe of people who'd known each other forever. And um, we would share a lot of, of our, our joys and our heartbreaks together. And um, that was wonderful. But Lori and I became friends outside that group as well when we all started to paint, and then we had a, a big group of that, and of course you've seen Lori does extraordinary work. Um, and she, I think because of her athletic prowess, she just brought that enthusiasm with her to painting, and she was one of those painters who never doubted herself. I mean, I haven't really seen that in a lot of people. She would just do it. And she would just, with so much gusto, you know, it would come out in the artwork. And that was, that was just really a joy to see how much joy she took in it, in everything that she did. But that's not what I wanted to talk about, is her art. I wanted to talk about the last, the last few years when it was really difficult um, for her. And we would talk on the phone on a regular basis and and, you know, we had to talk about the difficult stuff. We had to talk about the treatments and how she was feeling. And 
um, we shared we shared that and never even up until the last few weeks I never heard it in her voice I never heard the pain in her voice she goes I'm not feeling good and I go are you sure because you really sound good and she she just had so much inner spirit and it came out um, every time I talked to her and so we would start off listing all the treatments and going through what was going on and then I'd say well you know do you have to go into Santa Fe and she goes yeah and then she would say something like yeah we gotta get up at half past the crack of stupid tomorrow morning and go down there and that would set us off and we would become so silly and so joyful and we would start to laugh and I never minded calling Lori and listening to her stories because we would always end up laughing she would find joy in even the mundane and you know we'd rally about what was happening with the planet what was going on with politics and all that kind of stuff and we would just be laughing and then and then we would always get around to just can't watch the news anymore just got to turn that TV off and she goes you know what I I think she goes you know what I've been doing lately I've been turning down the sound and I've been sending out love to all those talking heads on TV and I'm going what <laughs> you know and 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 she'd say it again and I go that's nice and in my mind I'm going I could I couldn't do that I'm really pissed so we have another conversation and we'd end up laughing and scratching and and it was just she was very funny and, and those of you who know her know that's true and uh, so then she'd say you know what I turned down the sound again and I you know I'm sending all these people love because they're part of this they're part of us and I'm I'm like okay so the third time was the last time she told me she had done that and then she passed away and in my in my grief one day I had the news turned down really low and next thing I know I'm turning it off so I I can only see the people and I start sending them love and I'm going Lori are you here and she said this is what I think she said to me. She said, we're all one. We all have to take care of each other. We need to love each other. And we need to love the planet. And I thought, well, how hard is it for me to turn down the sound and not listen to the rhetoric, but just see the light that glows in every single person? And I thank her for that. Thank you, Lori. And I'll remember that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, also, um, I think Sandy is going to share, is that right? Pardon? Jay. Oh, Jay's going to share? Okay. Change of script. <laughs> that was Sandy. That was Sandy, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Great, it's great to see you all here today. It just talks about Lori's love for you and yours for her. Um, I wanted to just to share two little stories um, that I love about Lori. And um, one is, uh, one time Ann and I, we uh, went to visit Lori and Robert, um, at his best, fixed just oatmeal in the morning. That was his job and he always did a great job. <laughs> and. Uh, and I think this is about two years ago, or maybe it was longer, I'm not sure, but um, Lori had had her, um, an operation on her breast, and she said, and she was very curious, so she said, do you want to see? Do you remember this, Anne? Yes, I do. And so, uh, right at the dining room table at their house, she undid her shirt, and she was just like, uh, showed us, you know, all her scars, and I was like, oh my God, I didn't say that to her, but I, I, I'm sure Ann and I were just like amazed that she would share that with us. And you know, the great thing about Lori is that she was curious and she wanted to share her curiosity. And the other great thing was she brought Eastern and Western 
um, medicine together and she was in charge. The doctor wasn't in charge. I mean, they might have thought they were, but she was in charge of her life. So that was like one story that I just, I'll never quite forget it because um, she was so like open to every kind of everything. And then the other a story I wanted to share with you is um, one about Robert and Lori. And it was the week before she died. And um, it was that week. And I had the opportunity to come in and even take my mask off, I think, in the house. And, um, and Robert has been just amazing. Um, I really got to see your true colors, Robert, <laughs> in a great way. So uh, here's Lori, and he's sitting right in front of her on a chair, and um, he's giving her sips of water, and he was doing it too fast. And Lori said, slow down. And he's like very, very gentle. He's like, okay. And he just slowed down and just said, are you ready? And then he gave her another sip of water. I'm like, oh my gosh, that is just like fabulous because um, I know that wasn't the only thing he did. He did so much for her. And it was just so great to see that. Um, he was so patient and, and kind. And um, so um, what I'd like to say in, in closing, I had a big long poem, but I think I'll forget that. I think, uh, you know, a lot of us helped today for the ceremony. And um, the reason I do it is because uh, the Dalai Lama says, we're all just really walking each other home. And, um, and I am thankful for you, even though I don't know you, and for this time together. So thank you. And I would agree with that. I don't know all of the people who are here today sitting out in the warm sun, but I know you must love Laurie and Robert and others who are a part of this, to be here to support, to pray, and to be comforted yourselves by the offerings that people have. Are there any others who have something they would like to share at this moment? Yes, you would. Step right up here, young lady. Bring your friend with you. <laughs> you You want to tell a joke? Luna wants to tell you all a joke. Yes, that's what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Where does the snowman keep his money? Where? 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 In a snowbank. Oh. <laughs> right now, that would sound pretty good. <laughs> okay. Do we have any other sherries? Yes, ma'am. Please. <laughs> Where's that snowbank? <laughs> I'm kind of taking on uh, those two words. Uh, I can do it. I can do this. And, and courage. Uh, curiosity. Courage just, you know, whatever. I wrote this last night. Um, I really would love to be able to just express it, but that's the courage. And you are a tough act to follow, huh? <laughs> so, um, I knew Lori, can you hear me? I knew Lori mainly through a little box on my computer every other week, uh, before diagnosis, but mostly after. I met her only once in person, and uh, when I saw her, it, wow, stature, beauty, 
gorgeous, just powerful. Um, early on in our group, um, she said, I'm going to beat this because there's so much that I have to do. And uh, it wasn't for her personally, it was for others. Um, like, there was so much she had to do to help and to give. The thing is, um, from being with her and witnessing her process, I'm going to stop here. I just want to say one thing about witnessing. Um, I know there's something more to this word, but I looked it up, and it's very biblical. Um, but it's also, it's, uh, when we witness, we, we need to share uh, what we witness. That's kind of the point of it. And we have all witnessed so many different parts of Lori. It's just amazing. Um, so witnessing her process, um, all of it, the pain, the fear, the love, the forgiveness, the surrender, the acceptance, and always going back to love. Um, I think we saw that love really grow. And uh, so witnessing this, I realized two things that were so important to me, um, that that was the work. That's the work. It was the work that was given to all of us and more. It's, uh, it's an impact that goes bigger than what we can't see um, or even explain. And uh, the second thing is that we think we know. We assume what our mission is. Um, but when in truth, we just don't know the details. So um, I, am, I am very much in love with Lori. And I am very, very grateful to have witnessed um, this. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> um, my name is Sally. I met Lori uh, toward the end of 2015. I had expressed to Jay that I wanted to put together a Course of Love study group. And the Course of Love is a metaphysical course. And she suggested Lori, and there are a few other people here that became part of that group. And um, Lori had already read A Course of Love and was very much into the same spiritual path that I was in. And we really bonded beautifully. Um, eventually, this group, we would meet, because uh, there were people coming all over, from all over northern New Mexico. So it was a tough, tough sometimes to find a time to meet. But we did. But eventually, through personal reasons and so forth, the group sort of dwindled away. And, um, Lori and I stayed friends and talking. That, about that time, in 2019, Sajit, who is part of the group that Jane was mentioning, uh, she put together this co-creators group. And as Jane said, we met for three years and are still meeting every other week. And so we did witness Lori's process of working through her, the challenges. One of the things that Lori left me came out in the beginning of the Course of Love group. She mentioned something that she would do in times of stress and challenge. She would pray and call for the most benevolent outcome for the highest good of everybody that was involved. And I remember that. I still remember that every time I'm in some kind of struggle, which is happening currently, I remember Lori saying, pray and call for the most benevolent outcome for everyone involved. And it always, always brings me back into peace. Now, at the end of our uh, co-creators group, we would always say goodbye by saying, we love everyone. I would say, I would love you all. But Lori was very distinctive. She would say, I love each. I love you each. And so from Lori through me, she is saying, I love you each. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am.
my name is Sharon Stover, and I got to know Nor Lori in about 207. I'd known Robert for many, many years. And our encounters were involving kids. And she, of anything, was about kiddos. Um, she led a covert operation, you might say, to help get the skate park built just across the way. And what she did was she, out of her own dollars, had these kids wear these t-shirts that put pressure on the elected officials that night. <laughs> Room full of kiddos with these t-shirts and hence the skate park is there enjoyed by many. Our son, um, also through a program that Lori participated in, uh, uh, Juntos that she developed as well as Los Alamos Youth Leadership. And when I told him about that I was coming here today and Robert and I had spoken and he said, Mom, of anything, Lori was about kids, but she was also a good steward. She taught me how to be a good steward and pass that on. Um, three other comments about Lori. Who can forget that Lori hug whenever you saw her that just embodied you, that you could feel the love from her heart going to yours like none other. Um, third one was we were talking one day about our customs during the holidays, about the foods that we eat, particularly at Christmas time. And I was talking about my family eating menudo. Uh, and she went on to talk about uh, something with pickled fish, and I can't really forget the name of it. But we both walked away feeling, okay, you've got it worse than I do, and she felt I had it worse than she did. Buddha Fisk and left side. Yes, Buddha Fisk and left side. Thank you. Thank you. Norwegian. Yeah, Norwegian. And she knew how to say it really good. Um, then, uh, you know, I saw her a couple times riding her Harley that she loved. That's pretty amazing. And she had this black fringe suede jacket. You know, she had all the gear. And she'd go by you really slow, but she'd flash that Lori grin like none other that knew she was on to an adventure. Um, and I guess one of the things that she taught me was that each day is a gift, and that is how she le lived it and how she embodied me to, to live it as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? And there will be time, of course, as we have meal to sit with each other, share with each other. Uh, some can stand up and share, or just as you're sitting with each other. Yeah. Someone else? I see someone pointing. No? Nope. All right. I'd like for us now, we have a wonderful picture of Laurie from all of the sharing that's taken place. And each of us carries a picture of her in our own hearts. And I think that's amazing how she touched us all in different ways. So I'd like for us to join in singing Amazing Grace, because what Laurie was, personally, Amazing Grace, even though our song will be about God's Amazing Grace, which came through her. And you'll find the words, if you need them, on the very back of your bulletin here. And someone's gonna turn on the music, I think. <laughs> on cue.
As you always share, Robert, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yes. You're allowed to do that. Thank you. Well, people sitting out in the sun, they're not going to allow me for very long. No. <laughs> the, uh, uh, again, thank you all for being here. I would uh, like to invite you to join us for a luncheon in the shade. Uh, uh, it's all organized and put on by this group that uh, was mentioned, the Gathering Gals or the GGs, sometimes known as the Gabbing Gals. The, uh, You're in trouble now. Yeah. <laughs> I've always been in trouble. So, <laughs> the, uh, Anyway, it will take them a few minutes to get organized, so uh, get things ready. So meanwhile, uh, we are all joined here as friends of Lori, and I invite everyone who doesn't know each other yet to do a Lori and make some more connections in her honor and, and know a few more friends. Uh, as I said at the beginning, she wanted this to be a party. So uh, in that, uh, uh, we're going to do this in, in that vein. But as you all know, parties don't happen by themselves. A lot of people were involved in putting this one on. And uh, if I were to name them all, A, I would forget somebody, and B, we'd all be out here in the sun a lot longer. So I will mention specifically Father Kelly, who's been a friend and, and advisor through this entire process, and we really appreciate that. Uh, there are many other friends near and far who could not be here today, particularly a large number in Minnesota. So we're going to do this again in a couple of months in Minnesota. The, uh, but I would like to mention, again, the Gathering Gals, and uh, my apologies for not listing all of them, because it would take a while. But I will mention in particular Sandy Nichols and Jay Burroughs, who have not only helped a great deal organizing this uh, celebration, but also uh, have been a great help to, well, to, to Lori and I, as have all the GGs, uh, and particularly over the last four months helped to me uh, during this transition process. So I very much thank them and all the GGs here. So uh, in a few minutes, we'll come inside for, for shade and lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Robert has been amazing throughout this whole process. And I, as a husband who have a wife who is dealing with many of the same things, can well appreciate all the challenges that he has faced. So I want to thank you, Robert, for being there for us, too, as we try to be there for you. I'm going to close, uh, perhaps strangely, but sort of appropriately for Laurie, because she was a child of the world, a child of God, a child of the universe. As a Native American prayer for grieving, I give you this one thought to keep. I'm with you still. I do not sleep. I'm a thousand winds that blow. I'm the diamond glints on snow. I'm the sunlight on ripened grain. I'm the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I'm the sweet uplifting rush of quiet birds in a circle flight. I'm the soft stars that shine at night. Do not think of me as gone. I'm with you still in each new dawn. If Laurie were here, I can only believe that that's what she would say. And I feel that she is here. So for her, I speak those words. May the Lord bless each and every one of you, however you perceive of God. May our Savior Christ, Jesus, whoever he is to you, surround you, embrace you, and uplift you. For this journey through what we call life, and to that journey which we shall call life in the next world, that when we depart from this life, we will not be bereft and deserted and lonely, but we'll find there others waiting for us. And I'm sure that butterfly represents Laurie, who says, yes, <laughs> yes, I can't wait to see you girls and tell you all about what's happening up here. So, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may he bless this meal that we share together, that it may nourish our bodies as we always look to Christ to fill our souls. Amen. Bless you all for being here. 
come right on in as quickly as you can in the cool of the shade. 